Okay, I'm so excited, I just can't hide it. Dear, dear hosts from the Wolfson and Horn families, where are you guys? <laughs> dear friends, and magnificently beautiful mentors and students, thank you for having me here at your unique event marking the Joseph Safra 2023 Olami Mentorship Summit. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Okay, the fact that I'm standing here today and delivering this speech is a statistical anomaly. And by statistical anomaly, I mean it's absolutely crazy. I'm going to start with a personal story. Do you know what my grandmother was doing about 80 years ago? She milked a cow every morning to bring fresh milk to her children before they went to school in Isfahan, Iran, as in Iran. But there is a twist to this story. She was hiding while milking the cow because it was forbidden for a Jew to touch the cow's body. Why? Because the Shiite Muslims had a metaphysical belief. They believed that Jews contaminate their food just by touching it. So my grandmother's Persian neighbors couldn't know and shouldn't know about the relationship she had with the cow. Otherwise, who would want to drink this contaminated milk touched by a Jew? The answer is no one. When my grandmother went to the bazaar in Isfahan, she was not allowed to touch the fruit because, once again, the hand of a Jew might contaminate the apples or the oranges. Obviously, she was a very naughty girl, so we didn't prevent her from touching all the fruit she could possibly touch just to spite the vendor. She mostly did it when his back was turned so he couldn't see her. When he did see her, and it happened a few unfortunate times, she used to chase, he used to chase her all around the bazaar, cursing her and waving at her with his shoe or his flip-flop, depending on the season. Yet my grandmother's life was a thousand times better than the life of my children's second grandmother. My children's second grandmother did not escape a fruit vendor who chased her while waving a shoe. She escaped the Nazi gas chambers. And these two grandmothers never dreamt that one day they will have the same grandchildren. Just think about it. One lived in Poland, the other lived in Persia. Different language, different culture, different food, different weather, different clothing, and only one thing in common, the prayer to return someday to the Holy Land and to never forget Jerusalem. And then the strangest <laughs> And then the strangest thing in the world happened to them, to both of them. Their prayer was answered. I'm telling you, it is the strangest thing in the world. What are the odds, just think about it, what are the odds that a grandchild of one woman from Poland would meet the grandchild of another woman from Iran and then marry her and raise children in an ancient language that was revived after no one has been speaking it for 2,000 years. I mean, such stories happen and occur all the time. We all know it. The world by now is a global village, a small village, and uh, everyone can imagine, I know, a Mexican man marries a Filipino woman, for instance. It happens all the time. But show me one more country in 2023 that lives and exists only 
on such stories. Only Israel. <laughs> the story of the Jewish people is the strangest story in the world. And the state of Israel, I beg your pardon, is a crazy statistical anomaly. This story has no parallel anywhere in the world. I'll tell you something else. If this strange story of our people would have been written as a fiction novel, for instance, this novel would be criticized as simply inauthentic and bad, bad literature. I mean, really, the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter are much more believable than the story of our people. <laughs> Do you think I'm exaggerating? Let's deconstruct it, shall we? Okay. So we all know about the Big Bang, which caused our ancient people, who lived hundreds of years in one land, spoke one same language, language cultivated the same land, crowned kings, and nominated judges, you name it, to be dispersed all across the globe. And when I say Big Bang, I actually mean it. From Ethiopia to Germany, Morocco to Eastern Europe, countless particles of one tiny people were dispersed to every direction. The chance of us maintaining our identity was literally, literally zero, 2,000 years. Let's dwell on this number for a moment, 2,000 years. Now, don't take it personally, but you are all annoyingly young. I love you guys, but you're so annoying, so, this youth of yours. You have no idea, and you have no way to understand this number, 2,000 years. Empires collapsed since then, others emerged, flourished, conquered, and then disappeared as well. Religions have become a study item for scholars. Vibrant languages of people who are a thousand times bigger than us have become the subject of ancient linguistic university courses. And what happened to the Hebrew language? Well, it survived. And not only as an archeological subject, but as a language in which people order food in a McDonald's branch at the mall in Jerusalem, and as a language in which a man tells a woman on their fourth date, or fifth or sixth, I love you, and you have And here's why it's even more strange. Because for 2,000 years, Jews in Yemen spoke Yemenite. Jews in Egypt spoke Arabic, Jews in Germany spoke German, and my naughty, lovely grandmother from Isfahan spoke Farsi. And then, like the Sleeping Beauty, exactly after 2,000 years, this dormant language was resurrected. If anyone wrote a novel about us, it would be easily labeled as science fiction. And I'm just getting warmed up here. Our people's strange ancestors had all the reasons to erase every remnant of their Jewish identity. Think for a moment about a small Jewish community exiled to the far end of the globe. I can see them now from the distance, the leaders of this community, and I can understand them maintaining their identity for, I don't know, something like 50 years. You know what, I'll be generous, 100 years. But 2,000 years? How strange is it? And if it isn't strange enough, every Jewish community throughout the century conducted itself in the exact same manner as other Jewish communities around the world. From Addis Abeba in Ethiopia to Krakow in Poland, Jews have maintained their identity throughout the generation despite having all the reasons to assimilate. Still not strange enough? I'll continue. 
Here is something even more strange. It doesn't matter where you were exiled to, you were hated, extremely, horribly hated. We all been to Madrid yesterday. We learned the lesson. And although Jewish communities have always contributed much more in comparison to their actual size, although they never caused any problems, those communities were inhumanly persecuted. Now, I'm not bringing any news here by using the old world we all know, anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism here, anti-Semitism there. We are so used to anti-Semitism that we don't stop for a moment to think how strange this phenomenon is, even more strange than our own people. What's common between Romanian anti-Semites and Tunisian anti-Semites, for example? What do they have in common? What's common between anti-Semites in 60th century Europe and anti-Semites in 19th century Africa? What did they do exactly, those anti-Semites? Transmitted across historical radio connection between each other for 2,000 years? Hello, 15th century Spanish Inquisition. This is 19th century Russia calling. Don't worry, mission continued, murder of Jews is accomplished. How can it be that these calm, culturated, educated people who contributed so much awaken exactly the same emotion all over the world for thousands of years? We already know that anti-Semitism is not a bug in the system. It's a feature of it. And this feature is alive and kicking even today in this wonderful era of political correctness, social media, and global village. Anti-Semitism refuses to die. Anti-Semitism is as eternal as the Jewish people. And here is the strangest part of this entire story. Our prophets predicted exactly this crazy, unbelievable, surreal scenario in precise details. Centuries ago, our prophets foresaw everything, really everything, against common sense and against all odds. They described every phase our people went through. Pay attention to their prophets because it is truly unbelievable. They said, you, sh you shall be persecuted in every generation. Anti-Semitism, check. They said, God will save you every time. We are all still here, right? Check. They said, you shall return to the land promised to you by God from the far corners of the earth. The state of Israel, check. They said, your land will not flourish and will remain barren until your return. Check, not a lot of people knows that. But the land of Israel was deserted for centuries and regained its glory only after the return of the Jewish people. They said, destructed Jerusalem shall be rebuilt and Jews shall get married there. Check. Try to book a wedding hall in Jerusalem. You will be put on a six months waiting list if you're lucky. And I hope there will be couples in here that will actually do it. <clears throat> Only 500 years ago or Hundred years ago, the thought that couples will marry in Jerusalem was really science fiction. Nobody lives there. Sometimes we look at reality in a trivial manner. But when, when you look into the depth of the Jewish existence for the past 2,000 years, it is simply impossible not to wonder what the hell is happening here. 
Now, throughout this speech, I use the word strange, but it is not the most accurate term. The accurate term is a miracle. A metaphysical miracle. <laughs> a metaphysical miracle which has no rational explanation. A miracle which is above nature. This conference is about mentorship. So I want to, so I want to mention my mentors. My naughty, wonderful grandmother, who escaped the bazaar vendor and still lectured my mother to protect her Jewish identity at all costs. She is my mentor. And your grandmother as well, each and every one of you guys. Your Argentinian grandmother, your Spanish grandmother, your Australian grandmother, your American grandmother, every grandmother that brought you here. My mentors are all the Jews who for 2,000 years of misery and suffering kept the flame of Judaism alive with heroism unparalleled anywhere in history. My mentors are the heroes who have been praying to return home for 2,000 years. They prayed so hard that God actually answered. My mentors are the generations of Jews who are willing to pay with their lives and with their family lives so that I will be able to live independently and with pride, without persecution, and with an unapologetic sense of Jewish identity. My mentors are the millions of Jews, the millions of Jews who held the torch, the same torch which enables me to know that my Jewish children will be proud of their identity and hold a weapon against anyone who dares attack them. <laughs> My mentors are your fathers and mothers who passed on the torch to you without allowing it to stop burning. I know it because you're all here. Each and every one of you owns an inner box with a diamond on which one word engraved, eternity. Don't dismiss this diamond, it is precious. You have been given a treasure called immortality. Celebrate this treasure, embrace it, guard it. Don't lose it. We are creatures who look for meaning, and this diamond is your meaning. It's your vocation. It's your goal. You are another link in an eternal, wonderful, heroic, miraculous chain. Do not be the weakest link. Embrace your Jewish identity. Visit Israel. Come to Jerusalem. It is yours as much as it is mine. Thank you.